you and I, even though it may seem an anathema to people, we promote both capitalism and austerity. Why mm -hmm. do we promote these in combination? It is because capitalist systems are just more efficient than other systems. All right. It isn't because we assign any sort of like theological or moral value to capitalism. And as to why we promote austerity, it is for the same reason. Psychologically and effectiveness wise, as an individual, it promotes those things. Communist systems, historically speaking, for obvious reasons, have always glorified austerity. What is this? This rocket is decadent and wasteful. If you want to win contest, your mind must be hard and joyless, like a Russian turnip. And this made sense. If you're actually trying to operate in, in any level economically functioning communist system. But the new communists aren't like this. So you have gotten this totally unique to modern times combination of communism and consumerism. Starbucks communism, I guess we should call it. It's communism, but with polyamory and orgies and in constant self-affirmation. Would you like to know more? Hello, Simone. Hi. I am so excited to be here with you, pushing through another pregnancy. Your upended I, turtle wife here. You, nice no, 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 no. You are an amazing picture of grace. Oh. And I want to talk about something here because it was something that I was thinking about that is just so fascinating because I was thinking about us pushing austerity, which we often push on our podcast, you know, austerity in your lifestyle. And this isn't to say that we don't sin. You know, I know I drink. I know I shouldn't do that. I know I indulge myself occasionally. It's but white I man water. You have to drink that or you'll die. I, I Yeah, right. I recognize I, I'm like a robot from a, a Futurama. My God, you're a mess. Leave me alone. Look at that five o'clock rust. You've been up all night not drinking, haven't you? Please, Bender, have some malt liquor. If not for yourself, then for the people who love you. You know, I need alcohol or I'll, I'll go crazy. European, um, you are a, a very European genetically. Like, if you look at your 23 Me, you're extremely European. Your people have lived off beer as their primary, like, nutritional water source. So people may not know this, and we should actually elevate this point that she's making here, because it is actually interesting. During parts of European history, because especially after we began to urbanize, because the water supplies became toxic often and you couldn't drink from them, the only thing that you could be almost certain did not, wasn't going to get you sick was alcohol. Was Coors Light. Well, that Coors Light, like, but, but watered down alcohol specifically, because mm -hmm. they would water down their alcohol historically. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know this. Like wine in, for example, a Athens, would you hear about them drinking wine all the time? In symposia, yeah. Heavily watered down. Mm -hmm. And this, we, we know this because they called like the Macedonians barbarians for not watering down their wine. They were like <laughs> those maniacs, drink <laughs> wine. Drunken maniacs, yes. And it was actually the same with beer in a historic context. It was mostly mm -hmm. meant to remove the microbes from it, but 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 they consumed prodigious amounts. So I am not that dissimilar from my ancestors. But you're, well, your body's kind of built for it. I'm just saying. And yeah, I'd actually say also, that. The, and it, I just you know people give give you shit for drinking beer flavored water, but in the end, beer flavored water, just like furries, is the most traditional path. Okay. It is. It is the most traditional path. I'm, I'm a trad for drinking Coors Light. But anyway, this is a completely off topic. Yeah, sorry. It's, here. it's, yeah, I, I've, I've had a long day. I'm, I'm too pregnant for this, as Candace Owens because we get, said. Well, I mean, on the topic of austerity, we often talk about austerity, and it is actually pretty rare these days for people to think about the combination of austerity and capitalism as moral systems. Historically, austerity was more associated with the communist system, mm -hmm. um, whereas consumerism was associated with, the, uh, I call it consumerism slash hedonism, was uh, associated with the capitalist system in, in sort of a historic context. Well, and I would say, it, you can tell me I'm totally off base here, but it occurred to me, even when you look, and, and we're talking, you know, blur your eyes here, cross your eyes a little bit, but when you compare historical cities like Athens versus Sparta or, you know, kingdoms, essentially. Mm. Sparta was, you know, the more communist kind of place. And it was definitely way more austere in comparison, you know, Athenians were these effete, wealthy, you know, high class differentiation groups. 
so I, let's talk about why this is the case, first of all, because this is, this is, I mean, if you are trying to functionally implement capitalism and you want to promise people something to get them to go along with the system that leads to a level of inequality that you don't get within communist systems, mm -hmm. you promise them that even the poorest will have a better life or even like the, the, like, let's say lower third will have a better life than your average person in a communist system. Mm -hmm. And this is true, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Also, when people historically have been implementing communist systems that are meant to practically work, well, you need to get them to be austere for the system to produce enough goods. You need to elevate austerity as a value system. The problem is a, a couple fold here. One is, is that today the communists don't actually plan to implement their system or are not seriously thinking about it. And so they can promise whatever they want. And so now you've gotten this weird mix of communism plus consumerism slash hedonism, which in a historic communist concept is a complete historical anathema, which we're going to talk about in a second, but I'm going to take this, box it up, put it aside. But first, we're going to talk about the weird mix of capitalism and austerity, because you have seen this in a historic context. And actually, where you've seen this in a historic context, you got supercharged capitalism. This was in the, so for people who aren't familiar with this, there's a famous book on the subject of Calvinism. Read the Wikipedia entry on this book because its subjects are pretty important to this particular discussion. The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism is considered a founding text in economic sociology and a milestone contribution to sociological thought in general. In the book, Weber wrote that capitalism in Northern Europe evolved when the Protestant, particularly Calvinist, ethic influenced large numbers of people to developing their own enterprises and engaging in trade and the accumulation of wealth for investment. To make a quick quote from the book that will help you understand how the iteration of Christianity that the book describes here aligns very, very closely with Simone and mine's own view of the world. Quote, Remember that time is money. He that can earn 10 shillings a day by his labor and goes abroad or sits idle one half of that day, though he spends but sixpence during his diversion or idleness, ought not to reckon that the only expense he has really spent or thrown away to be five shillings. Remember that money is the prolific generating nature. Money can beget money and its offspring can beget more and so on. Five shillings turned is six turned again is seven and three piece and so on till it becomes a hundred pounds the more there is of it the more it produces every turning so that the profits rise quicker and quicker he that kills a breeding sow destroys all her offspring to the thousandth generation he that murders a crone destroys all that it might have produced even scores of pounds we call ourselves secular calvinists but it's important to note that like our value set is actually very similar to the historic Calvinist value set. And Calvinists are often seen as inventing modern capitalism because they did so under the context of austerity, mm -hmm. which is to say you have a free market, but not just a free market, but a free market where you reinvest your profits in increasing productivity of the system, nice. which was not done under non-Calvinist early historical systems. So I need to give a bit of a history lesson here so people understand why this happened and why it led to America as we know it today. So for it's people history who don't time know, America was Malcolm. the um, majority. I'm so excited for that. Let's go. A majority Calvinist country, at least among its, its white residents, when it was founded, I think it was like 61% in one of the things I saw from the Heritage Report. So, so, so like, you know, it, this is something that's like, well, no, like a lot of people don't seem to know this. I think it was like in a, a one of the, the minority beliefs or like one of a few beliefs. It was one of a few beliefs that came together, but it was by far the dominant in, in colonial America. Mm -hmm. Well, it held the belief in a kind of prosperity doctrine, which was to say, if God wanted to show you that like you were meant for heaven, he would reward you with success in your career, which would lead to financial success. However, there's a big caveat that makes it very different from the modern prosperity doctrine. Spending any of that success on yourself proved that he didn't actually favor you. It, it, it proved that he tested you with that money and you failed. Mm. So you were supposed to make lots of money but you weren't allowed to spend it on self-aggrandizement. You resist and, temptation. And only the most powerful can resist the amount of temptation you get from great wealth, right? Yes. Mm. And this temptation came in many forms. You were supposed to resist 
any form of overstimulation. This included dancing, but also any sort of food that excited the mind or something like that. So they would often eat. This is where Kellogg actually came from in this early whatever movement, right? Where, where it was like, we need to make a cereal that is the most boring cereal in the world for people to eat because we don't want them to be overexcited by too many flavors. And we can, that's a whole different thing we can get into. But the idea was, is that you would eat very plain food. You would not have servants you would not dress in fancy outfits and very importantly you would not donate to charities because charities were seen as a form of self-aggrandizement because you know whether it's the church or anything else because keep in mind calvinist churches anyone who's been to the traditional calvinist churches they were simple wooden buildings without art mm -hmm. any form of aggrandizement was seen as a uh, idolatry so you wouldn't have that so there was really nothing to donate to right so what did the people do with all the money that their entire lives were dedicated to earning you know they weren't allowed to have any fun they had to spend all their lives working and success in work was the sign of a gift of god but you weren't allowed to spend it on yourself they reinvested it all into the system they reinvested it all into their companies and they reinvested it into starting new companies and that creates um, scientific advancement amazing infrastructure really cool things right well yeah well it ended up creating a hypercharged ultra capitalist early economy and for people who are unfamiliar with the calvinist trope of this period ebenezer scrooge was the calvinist trope of this period if you read the book you know when they talk about him he ate gruel every day he did not eat fancy food he kept all of his he didn't even keep full candles on in his house all the time because he was oh. trying to save money and he wouldn't give away money to charities or family members it's, it, this is all said pretty explicitly I, I often joke that ebenezer scrooge is for the american calvinist value system like a corrective grape story so people who don't know what corrective grape is it's like oh that person's a lesbian but if some if they just had sex with a man then they'd realize how great it was and so this is for this this well, what i consider a more catholic view toward wealth is to say well only. if he just gave it to the poor he'd understand how great he would feel mm. and then he would be broken from this cycle but ebenezer scrooge was not keeping the money for himself it is made clear in the story that he actually lives incredibly frugally and that that is you know with the end goal of, of this traditional calvinist system anyway also ebenezer is one of the most calvinist names ever it, it, would, it would be like <laughs> calling a, a a character like you know, Noah Greenberg or something, you know, it's like, in fact, in the, in the guide to Puritan spotting that Sir Slate Codex, Scott like Alexander wrote, yeah. do they have a relative with the name Ebenezer is, is one of the, the boxes. <laughs> but anyway, you got to go back to the story here. So uh, in early America, you had a combination of capitalism and austerity as a value system, and it led to an explosion of economic and cultural potential. But we as a country lost that. Why did we lose that? Because surprise, surprise, people didn't like to stay in this system. Mm. Systems that urge this level of personal austerity and industry in combination do not do a good job of maintaining adherence intergenerationally, especially given how pro-science the value system was in a historic context, right. which led to its secularizing about a generation before the Jews secularized. So it was like more Jewy than Jews, which, which people often accuse the Calvinists of being because they were very tight with the Jews, you know, even to like, I'm going through my own family history. And just again and again, we see our family being very close with Jews and Catholics, which we, in our community was seen as quite a bad thing. Like that was one of the reasons we were fighting the Klan so much. It was actually interesting because I was reading some family documents is, is when they were fighting the Klan, the justification, at least if you're going two generations back and so multiple generations back, was the Klan's opinion of Catholics. Anyway, don't need to get into all of this. We need to get back to topic here, which is very interesting from the whole communist perspective. You and I, even though it may seem an anathema to people, we promote both capitalism and austerity. Why mm -hmm. do we promote these in combination? It is because capitalist systems, systems in which you allow independent things to compete against each other, are just more efficient than other systems. All right. It isn't because we assign any sort of like theological or moral value to capitalism. It is just the better working of systems for almost any goal. And as to why we promote austerity, it is for the same reason. Psychologically and effectiveness wise, as an individual, it promotes those things. So this is our core drive. I mean, do you have thoughts on this further before we go into the communist side of things? 
I mean, I, I just like it. I, I think that when most people think about capitalism, at least when I think about what I was taught about capitalism as a kid, I think inequality, I think haves and have nots. And I think rampant consumerism when you're right. I mean, the, the type of capitalism that gets us excited and the type of capitalism that we see being undertaken by at least many of our the, the business leaders we admire most is definitely this Calvinist form of this is about building something bigger. This is not about the money. This is about the vision. Well, it's, it's a capitalist system that tempts the best in that system, i.e. the you, smartest and, and hardest work ethic and most industry people. Yeah. It tests them with temptation. Yeah. And well, you they, can argue that in it, capitalism is treated in our and a general Calvinist framework similarly to how emotions are treated. It's a signal. It's important to know because it tells you if you're doing well or not, right? Like if, if something generally feels good and is not painful, it's probably a sign that you're not hurting your body, at least depending on the factors. In the absence of modernity, I should say. But your job is to rise above the, that thing, be it in an emotion or money, and accept it as a signal, but not let it run your life, right? Well, so well, neither of them is money. Is it's a system. Capitalism is a system within this mindset to test the most industrious with the most temptation yeah. so that they can prove their worthiness as the most industrious through not succumbing to that temptation and redeploying that capital to improving society's overall efficacy mm -hmm. and efficiency, which is very different from the way we view capitalism often in a modern context, which is that it tests the individual and then rewards them with hedonism. Sorry, getting close to the, the birth year right now. Yeah. So you're, you're going through a lot, which I appreciate. You know, you're still out there creating these videos despite the pain you're going through. And that's the type of austerity that I genuinely admire and, and will make my children better than me. Maybe they won't succumb to this in the same way I have. No. But anyway, next, communist systems, okay? Systems. Communist systems, historically speaking, for obvious reasons, have always glorified austerity. If you look at the communist propaganda, the perfect communist was the man who didn't take all of their rations, who didn't take all of their luxuries that was offered by the state. He would eat his turnips raw, you know, and that was his favorite food was raw turnips. Because, you know, that's the easiest to produce source of calories, right? And it showed <laughs> that he didn't succumb to the consumerism that was seen as the core temptation that the bourgeoisie would use to try to bring him over. Mm -hmm. What is this? This rocket is decadent and wasteful. If you want to win contest, your mind must be hard and joyless, like a Russian turnip. I ordered from Meaty McMulligans. I hear it's awful, but if you don't like it, we'll just throw it out. Oh, that's so wasteful. Nonsense. Your mom's enthusiastic spending is exactly what Jesus had in mind when he invented capitalism. And this made sense. If you're actually trying to operate in, in any level economically functioning communist system. But the new communists aren't like this because they don't actually have real aspirations of operating a communist system. They're mostly just complaining about the system they're in, or at least they haven't thought through, like they haven't thought through the consequences of what if I succeed with this message I'm telling people, all they want to do is undermine capitalism. They don't think about what happens next. And so you have gotten this totally unique to modern times combination of communism and consumerism. Mm -hmm where the communists are told you have the wealth so you can afford your iPhones and Starbucks. In, in your communist system, you're still getting Apple products, of course. We wouldn't deprive you of that. You're still getting your fashionable, funky, niche subculture brands instead of being, having to dress in like, you know, rice sacks, basically, because... They're using this to, to, to lure people in to what has drifted from modern communism is now more like a cult because it's not really meant to work as an economic and political system. It's meant just to convert and to tempt people. Yeah, it's so funny because, yeah, there is this vision of communism that I feel like I kind of grew up with, with the, the Cold War, which is people making immense sacrifices 
for their nation and living very uncomfortable lives in service of a larger vision. Yet now everyone I know who has a Marxist bent is more arguing that they shouldn't have to work and they should be given their fair share of resources. And it's not about, well, I, what am, I, I want to contribute. I'm going to take less than I need and give more, which is really wild. So they're basically arguing that UBI was in a capitalist economy is really what yeah. they're arguing for. But, but I mean, where did we go off the rails here? We do. I'm, I'm telling you where we went off the rail. Old communist systems were designed to work, not just designed to be popular. Yeah. New capitalist systems are just designed to be popular. To be popular. Mm. And I should point out that we have moved so far that that to be a communist these days, you have to be completely blind to reality. I mean, I think we've been watching a lot of Chop slash Chaz videos recently. You know, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone or District or whatever you want to call it, and it is the, and we might do a full video on this, the perfect representation of why communism doesn't work. Because the moment you begin to implement true communism, you know, communists will always say, well, real communism does, you know, does work. It just hasn't been tried before. We're like, no, people keep trying it. It just falls apart day fucking two. You know, they tried originally to implement real communism in the USSR. They tried to implement real communism in CHOP. But the moment they do, because it has no standing military, right, it's immediately taken over by a warlord, mm -hmm. you know, Raz Simone in the case of CHOP. And then it's immediately taken over by warring factions that lead to violence on the street with people trying to take resources from other people. Because, quote unquote, real communism, as they define it, is a hierarchy-less society, which unfortunately means you do not have people in positions to create the structured systems you need to prevent bad actors from manipulating the system to their advantage. And this is why whenever people try to create real communism, it always ends up being taken over by bad actors who say, oh, well, some people are more important than others. Some, you know, economic systems are more important than others. And they're like, come on, this doesn't happen every time. It's like, well, okay, first of all, it literally does happen every time. You, you can't even keep a Reddit thread without this happening. You know, look at what happened with our anti-work, right? Where this yeah. ends up taking over and speaking on behalf of the community you know, the community is like, how could you do that to us? And it's like the moment these people get the ounce of power, they take it and run with it. Because, you know, you, you're, you're not able to create systems where people don't abuse the power that you have handed them. And so, and, and people are like, well, come on. What the far left in the United States is fighting for, they've already included a racial hierarchy in their ideology. Okay, bro? Like, they've gone full, like, not-so-communism already and they haven't even gained power yet if you look at chop they did things like put signs in the community garden that said for black people only they did things like you can watch speeches from there where they said okay everyone in this audience has to give ten dollars to a black person in the crowd they created a racial hierarchy okay and and like always happens whether it's a nazi or a communist system the races that they put at the bottom of the hierarchy, like, you know, there was that productive farmer ethnic group within the Soviet Union. I was thinking of the Cossacks here. That they had to completely demonize because an economically productive group must be demonized by the communist system in the same way that the Nazis demonized the Jews for making more money or the progressives demonize white males for making more money and contributing more to the economy. They need to demonize the individuals who contribute the most to the economy. Because that's how these 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 systems work. It's how they recruit people, and it's how they endear themselves to the individuals they've recruited. And yeah, it is it is scary to me that we are getting a communist system that is somehow literally worse than any communist system that's ever been attempted before. It's communism, but with polyamory and orgies and and constant self affirmation. Well, no, no, it's it's. Where the problem is, because I don't care about the orgies, I don't care about the polyamory, it's communism without anyone doing the work. And that's... No, they need to make slaves do the work. 
they're they're former capitalist overlords. That's what communists always does. They take whichever groups they see as being in power and they treat them as a labor class. I mean, yeah, but that that's that doesn't I mean, work and then it falls apart. You can't do that to. sustainably. What I mean, yeah, it doesn't necessarily fall apart. I mean, slavery, you mentioned Spartan as a communist system, and it was. It was a communist system among the ethnic group that was considered human, and then the rest were slaves, the helots, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's what you have within the progressive movement today, and that's oh, really what they're planning on. Hmm. And I, I just, the, the, the like, white males who are fighting for this, or the, the white females, or the black males like anyone who is either male or white or cis who is fighting for the system and doesn't understand that they are meant to be the helic class in this system <laughs> is incredibly stupid um, they are signaling this to you as loudly and clearly as they can you will not have rights your your views will not be heard okay and you will have everything taken from you and everyone who thinks or looks or has the same sexual orientation as you. Yikes. Yeah. But yeah, that's, I think it's important at least to highlight that the Marxism being sold to people today is not from my understanding what was supposed to be, which is interesting. No, right. I know it's, 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 I mean, you could say it's different from historic Marxism, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. It's yeah. the way Marxism always turns out when implemented. And that's what matters. Okay. The real communism has never been tried TM thing. It's so disgusting to me. So it's like, what do you think that literally every attempt at implementing a communist system, even CHOP, even our anti-work was a bad acting, like, like was just all bad actors. No, mm -hmm. they tried as we say in our book, it's like trying to build an upside down pyramid. It's an intrinsically unstable structure that collapses into the same shape. Every time you do it, you are building an unstable governing structure. But what's worse is you are building it extra unstable because you are in including within communism, hedonism and consumerism. You're including all your brand name nonsense. And so I think that, if we can build a system, what's really interesting about this is the communists were not wrong about the uplifting of austerity as a cultural value system, mm -hmm. right? Where people can earn cultural points and achieve higher cultural status through being more austere. I think when you combine, that's, that's where the communist got things right. They were right about that. When you can combine capitalism with austerity, that's the perfect economic system. Austerity is a cultural value. Whereas the perfect evil cultural system is communism plus consumerism slash hedonism. Yeah. And Starbucks communism, I guess we should call it. That's Starbucks that's communism. I like that. That sounds fun. Starbucks communism or Apple communism. I don't know what I like more. You like Starbucks communism more or Apple Starbucks communism? Starbucks communism. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> And, and, and we, we, you know, they've been made fun of this for a long time. Like, how can you be communist and have your Starbucks cup, right? But I think that that was because people fundamentally misunderstood that these individuals were actually the perfect communists from their value set. Because communism's goal for these individuals is not to distribute equality across society. It's to distribute people like them the things they want, mm -hmm. which includes not working. Yeah, the core difference between, in reality, a communist economic system and a capitalist economic system is in a capitalist economic system, you go to work because they'll pay you. And in a communist ca system, you go to work because if you don't, they'll shoot you. And that's going to be just as true now as it was historically. And people can say, like, well, what about AI? Can't AI create UBI? Yeah. But if you're a total drain on the economic system, the AI has no more use for you than the other humans in that system, Okay. Well, I mean, people would argue, of course, that AI would be programmed in this case to always take care of people and just give them like who they want. Cap the, like wealthy people? You say, well, who's, who's creating this AI that's going to care about you? It will not. Okay? I'm just stating their position. Nobody. <sighs> Within a system, people don't care intrinsically about the economically unproductive because they're not relevant to the health of the system. And people are like, well, there's enough of us who want this stuff. We'll just force them to give it to us. 
And I'm like, this is the point. You, you, so often people are like, why do you focus so much on economic productivity of groups? And it's because groups without economic productivity do not have the power to push other groups to do things or to resist more economically productive groups when those groups want them to do something. You can say, well, there's a lot of us, but it doesn't matter that there's a lot of you if you can't go to war, if you can't organize. And you can say, well, we can vote. And I think, you know, we, we should be at a point by now in the American system that you should know just because you have a lot of people who will vote for something unless it's the overwhelming plurality which you don't have that doesn't mean what you want will come to pass. You have been convinced by your own ideology that your opinions and human dignity matter to other people when it is clear and plain to see when we look at the world today that they just don't. I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm just saying they don't. What matters to other people is your ability to produce things that they want. And if you can't do that, i.e. industry, economic productivity, then you have no power to influence the opinions of others. This is going to become increasingly important and clear as AI replaces more and more of the population in terms of its productivity. Yeah, well, and that's, I mean, that's why in the end, I'm not terribly worried about a lot of these ideologies. I mean, okay, they should, I should be terribly worried because they can cause immense amount of damage while they play out but over the long run there's just no way that they can sustainably exist because if you don't create value if you don't advance human society if you don't use the resources that you have well and conserve them and make the most of them and innovate better ways and more efficient ways to do things and empower people to do that and figure it out on their own then you're going to fail so these systems are destined to fail and that should give me comfort but i guess i should also be very concerned about well, I mean, just hope that, that, that existentially that none of our descendants ever end up in a system that's beginning to turn communist. Right. And that we, we, we teach our kids to leave the U.S. if it's moving in that direction because people will die. That's the way this always works. Yeah, that's that's the part I'm not thinking about enough, and I should probably be planning around and worrying about a whole yeah, lot more. Yeah, you can read more books about the killing fields. You can read more books uh -huh. about the, the revolution in Cuba. You can read more books about the revolution in Russia. There's plenty of books. I, I just think that you would find them too disturbing because I know you yeah. react so emotionally. Especially if, yeah, children or babies are hurt, which obviously I'm sure they were. So let's just not. But yeah, you know I, what? I don't want to go over the don't, horrifying don't, things that happened. Don't, in, don't. Okay. Don't. And I love you. <laughs> okay, I won't go to it. I love you too, Simone. Uh, if people want to read about horrifying things happening to children, read The Killing Fields. A uh, great book about, I think, pretty generic communism. And this is agro-communism, agro but it's, it's horrifying. Horrifying. Yeah, the Red no Scarf Girl is also a pretty girl, but anything. not quite as horrifying. Yeah, no. Nope, 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 nope. I love you. Let's go hug our children. <laughs> All right. Love you too, Simone. Oh God! All right, is this the right order, or do I move myself? Sorry, I'm I'm waiting for Claude to explain. Oh God, everything hurts. I'm sorry. It's fine. Just prodigiously large. Well, um, you you won't be soon, and then you'll be sad about it because I know I, how you are. Honestly, after I won't. After Titan was born, I was like, you know what? I'm not sad about being. I'm not being pregnant anymore at this point. But then I am happy you're in pain because I remember how sad you got after the first couple of pregnancies. Yeah. Well, that's because both of our boys were like, I mean, Torsten was like five pounds. Octavian was seven. And we had Titan at almost nine pounds. And I'm pretty sure industry is going to be. Oh, easily like nine. 12 or something. Like No, she's not going to be 10. She's going to be nine something. But she's I, significantly larger than Titan. She's freaking huge. She's anyway. huge. I love you to death, Simone, and, I, and you will survive. You'll make it through. But I'm going to start. I'm going to say, 